Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with Frank Holmes. Frank is the man, and he's really well known for gold. This was recorded around the 1st of March, but the macro and gold views here are evergreen and still very, very valid. In this episode, we talk about macro, MMT, gold, inflation, and the changing capital markets. We cover a lot. If you're a fan of this channel, you'll notice that we cover quite a bit about alternative investments, and this always ends up covering gold quite a bit. But each guest really comes on with their own unique view, and I find this absolutely fascinating. Before you listen, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the podcast, or even better, leave a review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel or give it a little thumbs up. This really helps, and it really helps people find the podcast and keeps this thing going because I really love it, and it really helps. So thank you. All right, Frank Holmes. Enjoy. Frank, super excited to have you on today. Welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. And it's great to be with you. Yeah, super excited. So we had a we had an interview scheduled earlier this week, and you had a tire explode on your car. So we pushed this one in later on the week. So glad glad we could fit it in. Oh, yeah, seventy miles an hour on that Texas road. Thank God's a great road. Pop pop, and have to skid over to the side. And uh, you know what shocked me about it? Some guy pulls up behind me, and the blue lights are going off. It's not a policeman. I said maybe it's someone that is wants to try to tow your car for four hundred dollars or something. And it was a Texas road system that go around to help people if they have an accident. Oh, no way. It's, and, the, and I went to give the guy a tip and he said, no, it's your tax dollars at work, sir. <laughs> was, uh, look at that. Who says we don't have good infrastructure? Look at that right there. <laughs> well, we're short on time today. And I know that. So um, we've got a ton of things we could cover. But before we jump in, uh, for my listeners who aren't aware of who you are. Can you give a brief background who you are and what you do? Well, I'm a Texcan. You can tell by my accent. Uh, we all come back. Hey, um, 31 years ago, I moved down to Texas from Canada and uh, I am a, a full-fledged uh, Texcan. I have a dual passport, American Canadian. And with that, I was a research analyst when I first started the business in 1978. Uh, it was a quant approach to investing that I built an institutional desk for gold stuff fund managers. And that's how I became known for gold. I was the first public company to go public deal. I did was Franco Nevada, which is the largest gold wealthy company in the world. Uh, and then I got sick and tired of cold weather. I only really like it to ski. And the opportunity was to move to warm Texas. And in 1990, I moved down to here, bought control of US Global. And uh, we are a unique boutique that had the first Nobel Gold Fund. Uh, we're known for the world of gold. And then a couple of years ago, we launched the first public company that was mining Bitcoin Ethereum because we couldn't launch an ETF. Uh, and in the past 12 months, I've had an incredible success. I'm so, so fortunate with Jets ETF. Oh yeah, and these these are uh, words that should ring a bell in a lot of my listeners' audience, that's for sure. And before we dive into those in much more detail, um, I wanted to just start kind of setting the scene. So this is being recorded the 1st of March. Um, as I told you, I'm a little bit behind with publishing these things, but um, paint me kind of a, a little bit of the macro picture, what's going on right now in the, the greater financial markets. Every week we publish the Investor Alert, and it's a a theory that we have of looking at capital markets like you look at game film. Uh, give me three strengths and three weaknesses that have affected a portfolio. So we have China fund, we have Eastern Europe, we have global resources, we have gold, and we have the only luxury mutual fund. By the way, luxury goods has crushed the S&P. Uh, but coming back on this sort of process, and then we look at economic data points coming out next week, which could be either an opportunity or threat. So that's the SWOT model, comprehensive but concise, and we write about it every month, is called PMI, Purchasing Manufacturers Index. It's a very important leading indicator that we've done detailed regressional analysis for over 20 years, that it is a good predictor of commodity demand. So that impacts our, our comments on gold and on oil, anything to do with commodities. So what happened last year when the money printing started was first out of China, their PMI went collapsed and then all of a sudden it did a V shape and came right back over 50 and it's in the high, high fifties. Uh, America turned and Europe is still languishing. So we saw this and what we said last summer was there's a boom taking place in commodities. 
Now we have copper at an eight year high. And it's because whenever the one month is above three months, that means commodity demand is picking up to make motors. So copper goes up or cars are on the road. Whatever it is, is that it's a very helpful leading indicator. Uh, and we are still very robust and strong. Uh, Europe has come off the trough. America's robust and healthy. China's healthy. So commodities as a whole are going to continue to be strong. And then because of our China fund, we believe that there's tremendous logistic issues, huge problems. Uh, and so ships are waiting offshore in LA one month to get stuff loaded. So we're going to see supply restrictions, but demand rising again. So we're going to get this inflation. And we believe like John Williams and shadow statistics, if you use the algorithm that was used in 1980, when gold hit 850 and oil hit 50 bucks an ounce and silver hit 50, sorry, $50 a barrel and, and um, uh, silver hit $50 an ounce. If you look at that algorithm that's been changed several times and applied it, inflation is 9%. So I'm doing some renovations and guess what? Lumber prices up 100%, steel prices are up 70%. What do you mean there's no inflation? Uh, I can tell you there's inflation everywhere. So we believe that at still rates are negative and that we're in a trend where we're living with negative real interest rates. And uh, that's what makes gold an interesting asset class. Um, the other thing we write about is MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, which is being practiced by the G20 central bankers. And you can see that for 20 years, gold has been up 80% of the time and always a negative narrative every time gold corrects during this pattern. But it's been up because MMT is growing in presence and they basically the central bankers have a, a country club and it forms and it operates like an OPEC cartel and they continue to print money. So this money printing is different in South Korea versus Canada versus here, but it makes real assets very attractive and it makes disruptive uh, items like Bitcoin extremely attractive. Yeah, and uh, I think it was Jim Rogers that described MMT as more money today, and that's the perfect better acronym than modern monetary theory. I, I mean, love that. It, I'm going to have to borrow that from Jim. It's great. It's it because it's it, it's completely accurate, right? So I, I mean, this inflation. I, I I'm curious. Why do you think most people don't understand inflation? You know, it, this is touted as like the hidden tax. Uh, why why do people not understand that inflation is in fact here? It's just not evenly distributed. It's not showing up in the way that we expect it to show up. Why why is this so confusing for people? Because they can buy TVs cheaper each year. And, and they don't realize uh, that's not happening with iPhones. Uh, there's your inflation. It's much more than 1.5%, 2%. Uh, and and so it's a bit delusional, uh, but I think that people really want to trust the government CPI numbers. And they don't dig down and know there's an algorithm behind it. And the algorithm has its own inherited uh, biases. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, it's like this bucket is goods and services and goods have gone down in massive deflationary impacts and the services like healthcare or education have gone up exponentially. So the whole thing kind of levels out in the middle and yeah, there's not that much inflation. So you know what shocks a lot of investors when I try to tell them that for the past 20 years, this century, gold is up 250% over the S&P 500. No. Now, yes, it's a bit, been a better asset class, uh, better than Buffett. It's outperformed yeah. Buffett. Uh, and the gold royalty companies, which I favor, and we have a quant uh, gold ETF in New York uh, called GoAU, and it's 30% royalty companies. Well, Franco Nevada has, and Silver Wheaton, now Wheaton Precious, they've crushed Berkshire Hathaway. Right, right. I, I, so before we dive into gold in a little bit more detail, I, I, I mean, you mentioned MMT, you write about MMT. The enemy of MMT is inflation. Um, I'd, I'd be curious just to tease out a little bit more thoughts on MMT. I mean, it's inevitable at this point. I mean, it's basically already here, just in like it, we're ramping up into it. But um, what does the world look like that MMT is happening? Buy, buy real assets and <laughs> don't hold on to dollars? You know, buy real assets and buy real companies. And, and, I, and I, the other thing is that a lot of people really don't get it that the Swiss vote a bond, 
No one buys it, so they buy it themselves. They take this money and they buy Microsoft and they buy Facebook. They buy real businesses and they buy and they own 15% of their own market. You look at Japan, they've used ETFs to do this. And that, that to me is, is most interesting to see how that's taking place that they own 15%. So what we've seen here take place in the US is that the Federal Reserve this past year has used um, uh, ETFs to go in and massage where the yield curve is. And, and so they can't directly go and buy. So they bought junk bonds through an ETF and they bought corporates. So when rates collapsed, uh, they didn't happen in that secondary market and munis, the rollover costs were such a burden. So they came in and they bought tax-free muni bonds and bought ETFs. So that's another form of more money today going into massaging where the interest rate scenario is. Uh, and, and I think that investors are really only sophisticates. And that lends itself that this phenomena that's happening with Reddit or these other platforms, that there are so many young people that worked at Citigroup banks of the world and got their Series 7 or took an investment course or now changed their jobs, but they have all this knowledge. They have been going on the internet and they have been turning around doing all their research. Something like 50% of the research comes from the internet. They learn from and also podcasts. So they're listening to podcasts, the data shows, and YouTube, and they're going out and they're trading markets. So I think that that's another really important part of price discovery that how capital markets are changing positively. Yeah, it, they certainly are changing. And with all of these, uh, these other macro things at play. I mean, I'm, I'm curious, obviously you don't have a crystal ball. None of us do. And there's buyers and sellers on every market. And the market has this way of proving you, <laughs> making you feel stupid all the time, right? But uh, where, what does the world look like in 10 years with MMT more prevalent, um, massive funds scraping Reddit and Robinhood data and front running, like, like what does the world look like? Uh, in your view? Well, I think you have to take a look at where the biggest disruption is going to take place. Uh, and I think that that will continue. The success of uh, Kathy Wood's uh, ARK ETFs is just phenomenal. They're active ETFs. It's focused on five different asset classes that are being very disruptive. And uh, blockchain uh, is basically the, the theme that she has. And Bitcoin is a subset of that, uh, along with robotics, along with space. Uh, and, I, I, and, and storing of energy. So I think uh, our global resource fund made a big pivot, uh, a focus not on, on, on the big index of oil stocks and an alternative energy. And we've been able to crush all the other indexes in performance. So it's being able to recognize what is gonna be disruptive and have that first mover advantage will be very important uh, in where, and who's gonna be the leader. Remember when we first got the internet it was Ask Jeeves. Well, what would happen to him? He's gone. And uh, then it was Yahoo. Well, what happened to Yahoo? Google to basically displaced them. So we don't know where it's going to be exactly, but you have to recognize that there is a disruptive transformation going on. And I think it's great for your brain to be analyzing and asking questions. And they say that's the biggest way to not get Alzheimer's. You know, if you challenge your brain and to look at these things. So Catherine Woods, she takes her ETFs that go from a couple hundred million to three billion. And then they go exponential to 15 billion, now 60 billion. Uh, and she's focused on these disruptive industries. So I think that's important. I also think that you have to look on the element table and say, where are the shortages of what commodity? And position yourself because the um, ESG, which is a new phenomena, is making it much more expensive to explore, to develop, to produce, to ship any type of a commodity. And you need commodities, you need lithium for those batteries. And if you wanna have a supercharged battery, you're gonna need uh, other types of elements in the periodic table to enhance that, that conductivity. And, uh, and it's, they're not there. So why, what, do you, what happens when we take a look at copper? Oh, we're gonna to have to spend a trillion dollars in infrastructure? Guess what? Copper is gonna double from here then. Uh, why? Because the supply of copper out of Chile is dropping. And unions there make it more disruptive. The world is turning, and, and I think a trillion dollars came out of Europe for bonds that for to try to stimulate the economy if they were carbon neutral footprint. So these are, uh, and we say this in all our prospectuses, 
government policies are a precursor to change. Thus, we monitor both fiscal and monetary policies, and they are bifurcated. Either it's monetary or fiscal. Monetary is money printing or real interest rates, and fiscal is regulations or taxation. So you can see where the flow of funds will go and where people will go by just simply creating a, a macro model. But most people get caught up, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I can't say what that person said. They miss it. It has nothing to do. It's government policies. Obamacare, oh, it's so bad, it's so bad. You want to run out and buy the healthcare stocks. They grew at a 40% CAGR for eight years. You made a ton of money on the negative. And, and along comes Trump and everyone's negative on Trump, et cetera. But guess what? Everyone discovered the stock market. That's what they did. And, and, uh, and he turned around and said, you can't come up with new regulations unless you drop your regulations. And so policies that Obama brought in under crowded funding, such as SPACs got elevated, never took off. Uh, I can take a look at other formations of capital, but under Trump, they took off. So it's, it, if we want to be negative on them, okay, do the opposite. There's a hurricane hitting Florida. Do not buy insurance stocks. Who do you want to buy? Housing stocks, rebuilders, building stocks. Uh, there's a, whatever there's a crisis or a big negative narrative, there is an opposite positive. That's something your brain to do. That's what Charlie Munger calls second level thinking. And that's what makes it fun. Uh, second level thinking is very, very important. And another Jim Rogers ism, I guess, is white YG, uh, where the ch Chinese word for uh, crisis is the same as opportunity, right? And it, 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 I think of that. Uh, so second time I've thought about that the, during this during this uh, interview. So I I think it's important to think about these uh, second order uh, decision making with all of this, um, and then the disruptive new technologies. Uh, I think this is very valid, but. I kind of want to take the reverse now and and go a, a, a non very not very disruptive not very new technology and uh, get your views on gold. So we talked about commodity shortage and all of these things, but um, what about the asset that's maintained a store value for thousands of years? What are what are your views there? One of the big parts of gold, and it's a bite, once again it bifurcates uh, for demand. We look at demand. And I've characterized it as love trade and fear trade. The love trade is, is jewelry demand, but there's a lot of emotional attachment, not just getting married, like the wedding season is so prominent as a big demand in India, but this is the year of the ox or the year of the bull. So if you're born in this period, every 12 years the, is the year of the bull. Well, guess what? You're going to get a gold, gold bull and in China. And if you're a very wealthy family, you're going to get a bigger gold bull. So there's an interesting phenomenon that took place. If we go back 30 years ago, Chindia, China and India, actually known for 40% of the world's population. And back 30 years ago, India was a bigger consumer of gold for love. And when we look at the two countries, they were 10% of all demand for gold. Today, they're almost 60%. Why? Because the GDP per capita has exploded that China and India 30 years ago, didn't even register in the top 10. And now it's China, India, America, and then Japan, and then you see Germany. So their rising GDP per capita means they buy more gold for love. They buy more grams of it and different reasons for it. But that's what's important. So every time gold goes to a big correction, the love trade buys it. Every time it goes up because of the fear trade dramatically, they slow down on their buying. What happened last year and the year before, we had these six month runs where gold made new highs and it was predominantly fear. Well, what drives the fear? Negative real interest rates is the shortest thing that in a, by the day, negative real interest rates. So last year, this time, rates are almost 2%. They fall to 50 basis points. So a 10 year government bond is, uh, is yielding you at say 10, 50 basis points. Uh, but inflation is running at one and a half percent. So you're losing 100 basis points, gold starts taking off. And, and so now we see that the 10 year government bonds elevated back to almost 150. So what does that mean? It puts pressure on gold, gold short term. But this is just the vagaries of the market, but that's short term. 
Long term is a massive 40% money printing, and not just by America, but rest of the countries of the world. And historically, it shows up about three years later. So after 2008, 2009, the Federal Reserve expanded its balance sheet by, by $3 trillion. Now we're talking about $6 trillion. After this is all finished, it'll be a $10 trillion expansion. You're going to see gold, and it's going to double from these levels. And we're going to see, I think, gold at 4000 It just doesn't go straight up. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of the short-term nature and sh instant gratification world that we live in, right? Yeah, I bought it now. I thought it was going to go up. But uh, love or fear driving this, uh, I love it. Um, I love it. But um, yeah, the macro uh, factors at play here, you kind of got to be bullish. I'd be curious. I mean, you talked a bit about uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum mining um, but I'd, I'd be curious your views on Bitcoin. Is it a just a higher beta play on the gold inflation narrative, or is this does this kind of fall into the uh, disruptive new technology bucket? Well, it's an alternative asset. There's no doubt. Just like um, art is too. So you can there's many different types of categories and subsets of what are alternative assets than the normal uh, bonds and, and equities. Uh, and, and Bitcoin you know, evolved uh, because of the money printing. So you had the protests on Wall Street, the AOC crowd uh, uh, protesting across America, and then the opposite side were the geeks, and they said, okay, we're going to go create a digital money. But what's interesting is they were used to digital money. Like I said earlier, I was sharing with you that, that so many of these kids grew up being successful at gaming, and each of the software providers of different games gave you rewards if you were good, and you could upgrade with other. So there's an inborn that they're so used to it. Uh, I think the other phenomena is the idea of, of digital wallets. Digital wallets have exploded. Uh, one of our analysts last year was in China, or 18 months ago, and he was commenting that credit card didn't work, and, and the store to get a toothpaste and toothbrush uh, wouldn't accept cash. Uh, they wanted the, 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 the digital wallet. Uh, which, so we're seeing things evolve and change this way. Um, so I, I think that um, you just have to be able to embrace how fast things are changing and how fast you can move with it. Yeah, and I think that's valid. So I, I'd be curious in what scenarios, so a lot of my listeners have a little allocation to both gold and Bitcoin, as well as all the other assets, you know, as part of the broader asset allocation. But in what scenarios in your mind would something like gold massively outperform something like Bitcoin or vice versa? Well, it's a good question. I, I, I haven't really sat down. I just knew that something was happening. I was trying to launch an ETF and I realized quickly due to the concerns of the SEC and then in Canada, the OSC, uh, was uh, anti-money laundering laws, a, uh, the AML, you know, and then it became KYC. So I had this knowledge and I sort of learned, that, and, and the big part was my pivot move was the CEO that owns, uh, that controls Fidelity. And Fidelity is a over a $7 trillion company and she has her CFA and she never, Abigail Johnson never speaks at investment conferences, but she's speaking at a crypto conference. And I said, well, that's a pattern interrupt. There's something happening here and that they've been mining for a while. And that gave me the sort of unique legitimacy and why blockchain is going to be so important as, a, as an asset class. And so with that, I had the knowledge and we went out as the first institutional investor. I became the chairman of high blockchain technology and it went public. It was a raving success. Crypto went through the roof. We raised $200 million. Fidelity gave us lots of money. We would start buying and mining Ethereum at the beginning and then Bitcoin. And then we had the crypto winter, and now we've come back. That high last year was the best performing of all the crypto stocks. It was up crazy, 2,500%. Ethereum was up 470, Bitcoin was up 300%, and gold was up 25%. What a bore gold was. But gold is still a key component. I've always advocated it should be 10% of a portfolio. Gold's DNA of volatility uh, is, is the same as the S&P 500. Bitcoin is like Tesla. In, in the, the number is five times greater. And if you look over 10 trading days, it's even more phenomenal that how volatile Tesla is because it's disruptive. Bitcoin is disruptive. Bitcoin is new. 
And it reminds me of like Andy Warhol art at the beginning was very disruptive. A painter, what he did, his whole lifestyle, all that stuff was all, you can't do that. Well, that Mao print that came out at $1,000, uh, the five different colors and a thousand different prints uh, it went to a quarter million dollars. So as more people want to go buy limited supply, it rallies. What's different with Bitcoin is what's happened with technology is called fractions. So you can get at Schwab a fractals of a stock that trades at thousands of dollars like Berkshire Hathaway. So Robinhood allows you to go and buy a fractal of Bitcoin. And Robinhood, interesting enough, uh, along its toolbar, allows you to buy gold. You don't see that at Fidelity or Schwab, but gold is an asset class. And, and then GLD comes out and you can buy fractals. You can buy $200 on Robinhood of the GLD. So you're getting a fractal of bullion. So these fractals and a limited supply mean these prices are going to trade higher according to Metcalf's law. And Metcalf's law is a very important way of looking at capital markets when you have an adoption like mobile phones uh, with their successes. So I say that Bitcoin is part of that alternative asset class. All these kids grew up digital money. It was easier for them to adopt. And just like GameStop, a lot of them shopped at GameStop. And Peter Lynch, a uh, famous money manager from Fidelity, he said you should buy stocks that you that you like. Like you use your iPhone, buy faith, well, sorry, buy uh, Apple. And if you like Starbucks and you drink the coffee, you should buy the stock. And anyone that's followed that model has been very successful. So all these kids come along and find out this big short position on GameStop. They're more educated. They're stuck at home. They're using Robinhood. This is a natural. They knew about the product, like buying Starbucks. They knew what it tastes like. So I, I see these are new phenomena happening. And for me, it's very important. <clears throat> and the operative word is price discovery. A real capital markets, the wisdom of crowds needs price discovery. And that's what's happened the past year. Was happened and continues to happen to today. We're we're clearly in price discovery mode. Well, Frank, I know your time is limited today, but I, I really appreciate having you on the show today. Uh, I'll link up a lot of the things we talked about. Um, but where can my listeners find a little bit more about you, or where would you like to send them? Well, I'll go to usfunds.com. Uh, our blog goes out to hundreds, hundred thousand people around the world in eighty countries. Uh, Frank Talk is a subset, some of my sort of thoughts and opinions on it. It's free. Uh, we do it as a discipline, uh, a, a money management discipline every week to have to crystallize what were the factors last week for next week. And, and so you can, you're going to live the curiosity how we look at markets. Uh, and I think it's easy, fast to read, and uh, you'll find it entertaining and sort of contrary in opinions. Uh, and that's probably the best way. And you go to our YouTube uh, we do a lot of educational videos. There's competition in everything in America, not just NCAA football and basketball, uh, but there's also in mutual funds on education. And we've been recipients of over 90 awards for uh, in a competitive arena for educating investors. So you can see those videos at, at our, off our website at usfunds.com. Awesome. And I'll link all of those things. Frank, really appreciate you taking the time and coming on today. Happy investing. Awesome. There you go. First off, thank you very much for listening all the way through. I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation. As always, you can find show notes, links, and more at altassetallocation.com. Please share this with anyone you think might be interested and derive any value from this conversation. And as always, you can reach out to me for any feedback or questions. Please give the video a like or even better subscribe on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. This really helps others find the podcast or the video as well. Thanks a lot. Hope everybody has a fantastic day and stay safe out there and invest wisely. Cheers.